and our ears are attentive. Speak, Lord Jesus, and when we hear you speak, may our only response be yes and amen. For the glory of your great name, we pray and ask you for it all. And all the people of God agreed and said, Amen. Well, good morning. I greet you with Jesus' joy. What a joy and privilege it is to be back with you. I love your pastor. He is a friend and a brother beloved, and I am grateful for the sacred trust that he has extended to me to be with you again. Not only once, it's one thing, I told the earlier crowd, it's one thing to invi be invited once. It's a whole nother thing to be invited back. And so I am grateful that he has graced me with the privilege of being at Grace Life one more time. Well, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So if you have your copy of God's Word, will you join me in Proverbs chapter 24? Brother Esteban has already read that scripture for your reading, but I would invite you to turn your attention back there, Proverbs 24, as I seek to fulfill the assignment that was given to me by Pastor Joel. Chap Proverbs chapter 24, I'll always invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, Proverbs 24, beginning at verse 3, hear ye the word of the Lord, through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Amen. That's the reading of God's word. You may be seated. I simply want to use again in the fulfillment of my assignment, building blessed families. Today, as we continue your series from the timeless wisdom, the timeless truth of this book called Proverbs, my assignment from the pastor was, come talk with the people. What does it mean to build blessed families or happy homes? Proverbs is known for its practical advice and for its deep insights. It offers guidance on various aspects of life, including family relationships. And so for today, my assignment, I seek only to share with you a few gems that will help us cultivate blessed families. Just as a house needs a strong and solid foundation, a blessed family requires wisdom. Proverbs emphasizes the importance of wisdom in building a strong and secure household. So therefore, it is imperative, it is urgent that you and I understand individually and collectively that we must seek wisdom through prayer, meditation, and the studying and obeying of God's word. That if we are indeed going to build blessed families, it is imperative for you and I individually and all of us collectively to seek wisdom. And we do that through prayer, through meditation, and through the studying and obeying of God's word. This list is not inclusive of all. It's not as expansive, but just want to deposit some truths, some principles that you and I may, may be able to glean from and apply to our everyday lives that might help us in the establishing of blessed families. We start off by talking about wisdom. Wisdom is necessary. Wisdom is not knowledge. Knowledge is important, but knowledge is just the gathering of information. You can go to school to get knowledge. You can take classes to get knowledge, but wisdom comes from God. In fact, James says that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally. That it's more than just having knowledge. It's just more than just reading scripture for knowledge base. But what do we do with what God has deposited in us? 
I spend a lot of time with a lot of pastors, and I'm always intrigued when I enter into pastors' offices because in most cases, they have bookshelves that are full of books. A lot of knowledge, a lot of books. I'm guilty of that. I've got books everywhere. In fact, my wife tells me, don't you bring another book to this house. We don't have enough shelves for you, all of your books. But I'm always intrigued. First of all, have you read all of those books that are on your shelf? My wife often asks me that. Do you read all of those books? And many of them I have. But here's the more important question. What have you done with all of the knowledge that you have attained from all of the books that you've been reading? Because it's not just good enough to gain the knowledge if we gain the knowledge and like a book on the shelf, we place it there and for the rest of our days does nothing but gather dust. So we understand that we as God's people must not be hearers of the word, but we must be doers of the word. We are those who hear the word, understand the word, apply the word, and obey the word. And in those steps of hearing the word and understanding the word and applying the word and obeying the word, then we individually and collectively can out of the overflow pour into our families and develop families that are blessed. So wisdom is necessary. But not only is wisdom necessary, love and respect is necessary. Proverbs 15, 17 says it this way, Better a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened calf with hatred. In essence, what he's saying that it really doesn't matter what's on the table. You might not have much on the table, but it determines, but if you, I'm sorry, Even if you don't have much on the table, if you have love at the table, then it will make what's on the table taste a whole lot better. That even if you don't have the fattened calf, if you don't have the abundance of resources, if all you have are vegetables, but if you have love, you have all that is necessary. So it's not always about what you have on the table, but it really necessitates who you have at the table because if you have the right people at the table, then what's on the table becomes a whole lot more better. Love and respect. And I know that may seem almost uh, too simplistic for us to understand because you would think that love runs in abundance in many families and that's not always the case. Love is the cornerstone of a blessed family. It fosters unity, compassion, and understanding amongst family members. That if there is love and respect at the table, you can have hard conversations around the table. It's often said around holidays that when families gather together, there's some rules. That when you gather around the table, you don't talk about sports, you don't talk about politics, and you don't talk about religion. But when there is love and respect at the table, you can have conversations that perhaps everyone does not agree about, but you can disagree without being disagreeable. And so it's important that we might have love and respect, even amongst family members. And therefore, we must teach and demonstrate respect for one another, acknowledging that each person's opinion is important, But each person's inherent value and worth is important. That your opinion matters because you matter. We want to hear from you. But unfortunately, at many tables or in many families, there is this dichotomy of of you do what I say but not what I do. You listen to me, but I will not listen to you. But when there is love and respect, we understand that everyone at the table, every person in the family is a valued member of the family, and therefore they matter. Love and respect. 
Another simplistic truth that we might need to apply if we're going to really develop blessed family is this whole idea of communication. Proverbs 15 and 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Effective communication is vital for resolving conflict and nurturing healthy relationships within the family. We don't know how to talk to anyone talk to each other anymore. We now live in a society where social media and those little devices called cell phones and iPads and computers have dominated our families and now you can go into tables both in the homes and in restaurants and you might see four people at the table and everyone's on their devices and they're talking to people in other places around the world. They're scoping out what's going on in social media and the very people that's at the table, there's no conversations. We've got to learn how to talk to each other again. To communicate. To say, hey, how are you doing? What are you doing? What's going on in your life? What are you struggling with? How can I help? How can I pray for you? To gather together around the table of fellowship and open God's word together and understand that you have an opinion and I have an opinion, but there is really only one opinion that matters. So let's glean from the only opinion that matters. What does the word of God have to say about the matter? We've got to learn how to communicate one with another. Children must learn how to communicate with parents and parents must learn how to communicate with children. And we must encourage an honest, open communication and teach the importance of listening as well as speaking with kindness and empathy. And I know this seems so simple that it's so simple that many of us are missing it. But families are not talking. Families are not communicating. And these devices called cell phones and and tablets and all of that stuff is adding to the disconnectedness even within families. And as an older generation, as parents and grandparents, we must teach and train and model before our children what it means to be communicators of one another, or communicators to one another. Communication is so important. And when there is love and respect, you can speak hard truths. In love. That you can say hard things, but when somebody really believes that you love them and respect them and only want what's best for them, that even when you speak hard truths to them, they understand that it comes from a place of love and respect. Love and respect is imperative. Communication is imperative. Discipline and instruction is important. Proverbs 22, 6, that familiar passage of Scripture, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn away from it. We have a responsibility to train up children, train up the next generation. We must teach them. We must discipline them. We must instruct them. We must teach, train, and model what it means to be a disciplined believer. Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you delight or bring delights to your desires. Children long for boundaries. Because discipline, when it is administered with love and consistency, guides children toward wisdom and maturity. Discipline, when administered with love and consistency, 
guides children toward wisdom and maturity. We're looking at a younger generation that seems to be running amok, and much of it is because there are no boundaries. No one has taught them. No one has trained them. No one has modeled before them what it means to be disciplined. And so we must be the example for our children and grandchildren of what it means to be disciplined. They must learn how to communicate from us. So therefore, we must be able to provide constructive discipline and instruction that is rooted in love and aimed at nurturing character and Integrity. We have a responsibility because if we're not raising our children, society will raise our children. And they will get their guides, they will get their direction from society. They will look to their friends to get answers that they ought to get from their parents. And their, child, their, their peers will give them answers that in many times are shaped by the world. You don't want the world raising your children, but when we look at this condition of our society now, we have children that are running amok and it could be resolved if parents would take serious their role of raising up, training, teaching, and modeling before their children what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Training them, teaching them, modeling it being the example before them. That when they see or when they need to see a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, they ought to be able to look no further than their mother and their father. When they're looking for relationships that are the model and the example of godliness and respect and love, they should be able to look to their parents and see it modeled before them and therefore then they duplicate what they've seen. But when they don't see it, then they start looking for it from outside cues and they look for it from their friends and social media and Hollywood. Yet our responsibility is greater than it's ever been before. So therefore, we must train up our children. We must teach them. We must model behavior because we cannot teach what we have first not embraced. Then number next, not only must we discipline and give instruction, but we must also teach them and model what it means to be good financial stewards. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, honor the Lord with all your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Now, this is not some model for prosperity, but all it's simply saying is that if you prioritize your money, if you make God first in your life, then God will bless you with abundance. That if you honor the Lord with your wealth, then the Lord will honor you and fill your barns to overflowing. Proverbs 13, 22 says that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. I was telling a group a few weeks ago when we were talking about finances, I said, listen, God does not want your money. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He created all. God does not need your money. God wants you. And if God wants you, I mean, if God has you, then God has everything that belongs to you including your money, that when God truly has you, he reprioritizes where you spend your time and how you use your talents and how you give your resources. All God wants is you. 
Now, that may not encourage you, but that encourages me that God wants me as messed up as I am, as faulty and fickle as I can be. God wants me, and the good news from glory is yes. That don't encourage y'all, but that encourages me. He wants me. He loves me. He sent his son for me. And now it's this whole idea that I move from got to to get to, that I get to give. I get a privilege to give to the Lord. And he resets all of my priorities. Honor the Lord. And we as parents must learn to teach and model and train our children how to live within their means. Teach principles of financial stewardship, including giving generously saving diligently and living within our means to ensure ensure long-term prosperity and security for our families, that we have to learn how to model what it means to live within a budget, to not spend money that we don't have, buying stuff that we don't need, trying to impress folk we don't even like. And these devices called social media has made it so easy. Amazon is a multi-billion dollar company. They got a whole lot of my money. But it's imperative for us to understand this idea of discipline, living within boundaries, not overextending ourselves. But in a society where everything is instant, you pull out your credit card and you just charge it and charge it. Some of you are old enough to remember layaway. Remember layaway? Those younger generation know nothing about layaway. There used to be a time in stores when you would go to a store and you would see something you like and you would put it on hold and every week you would pay a little bit on it and pay a little bit on it until you paid it off and then you get to take it home. We don't have layaway anymore. Now we charge it and then we pay exorbitant amount of interest rates on our credit cards and then we're making banks rich because we're spending interest money on interest buying stuff and then many times once we've got it paid off we can't even wear it anyway I was going through my closet a few weeks ago and I pulled to the back of the closet and I had a whole set of outfits that I had purchased and all of them still had their tags on them and I'm not unique to that because some of us are guilty of that we buy stuff that we don't need spending money that we don't have. And all I'm simply trying to help us to understand is we must learn how to discipline ourselves and live within our means. And we must teach and model before our children what it means to be disciplined. To be able to say no. Let's work for it. Let's save toward it. Not buy now and pay later. But let's build a plan. Let's build a strategy and let's start putting away and saving and working toward it. Because in doing so, we're teaching them what it means to be disciplined. So we must model before our children how to honor the Lord with our wealth. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. All that simply is saying is God wants to be priority in your life. That when you make God number one in your life, it reshapes your priorities. That which used to be important is no longer important. So we must model that before them. 
Again, this list is not expansive. These are just a few principles that if we practically apply them to our families individually, then we can begin to help turn around our families. Our families are in trouble. Our nation is in trouble because our families are in trouble. Our churches are in trouble because our families are in trouble. As goes the family, so goes society. And we must begin to reprioritize God and make him the center of our lives. We must be people who tell the truth in love. We now live in a society where that society says there's no such thing as absolute truth. That I have a truth and you have a truth and my truth may not be your truth, but there is a such thing as absolute truth and that is the word of God. And we must return to the word of God as the center of our truth. And while you have an opinion and I have an opinion, all of that's good and dandy, but we must rely on the only opinion that really matters. There is an absolute truth. And we must return our children back to the truth. And we must center our families around the foundation of this truth, which means it becomes necessary for us to spend time in God's word together. I just need to say that one more time. Because I'm praying, I'm preaching a whole lot better than y'all are responding. We must return to the word of God and we must make the word of God a foundation. If our families are going to be turned around, if our families are going to be blessed, it's going to be when people, when families reprioritize and make God first in their lives. Put away the devices. Spend time in God's word. Turn off the television. Spend time in God's word together. Pray together. Study together. It is the family's, it is the parents' responsibility to disciple their children. It's not the church's responsibility to disciple children. Priority goes to the family. It's the children who are supposed to be discipled by their parents. So Proverbs offers these timeless truths, these wisdoms for building a blessed family. I am fully convinced that blessed families build happy homes. And by laying a foundation of wisdom, of love and respect, of open communication, discipline and instruction and financial stewardship, families can thrive and experience God's blessings. And by simply applying these simple principles in our own lives and in the families, in our families, we can trust God, relying on his guidance and his grace to lead us to a life of joy, peace, and abundance. That we want nothing else than to hear him say, well done. Well done in how you've lived your life, but also how you've led your family. Blessed families are families that bless God. Blessed families are families that reprioritize and make God first in their families. Which means occasionally you have to turn off the noise from the outside. Turn to God's word. Study together. Pray together. Pray with and for one another. Children should hear their parents pray for them. Children should hear their parents pray with them. We must model before them what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. 
I'm a product of a parent, a product of parents who understood the importance of training up their children. And we thought it was old fashioned and out of date. But maybe we need to return back to the way things used to be. When there was an expectation, discipline in the home, boundaries, and discipline. But always tempered with love and respect. And sometimes I have to love you enough to say no. And even though your friends may be doing it and they may have it, sometimes I have to love you enough to say no. Because some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. And we've got to teach our children what it means to work hard, to study hard, to earn what they have and appreciate what they have. And if we don't teach them those lessons, then they leave our homes and enter into a society that will eat them up without the principles that they should learn from home. That if I want my family to be blessed, I individually must bless God. I must also teach my family how to bless God. Bless God in how we treat each other. Bless God in how we treat others. Bless God in how we treat our finances. Bless God in how we steward the family relationships. Because I don't know about you. When I look at what's going on in our society, our nation is in trouble. Our families are in trouble. Our churches are in trouble. And yet we have the standard. We have the answers. And if we're going to turn it around, we must return back to the word of God. To not just be those who claim to be people of the, God, of the book, but to be people who live according to the book. And if we do that, then we indeed will have blessed families. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you.